Hi, I'm Dr. Scott Williams. I am a scientist in the Department of Forestry and Horticulture. Um, I'm a certified wildlife biologist and an amateur gardener. So if you're watching this, you probably know a little bit more about I do than about gardening, but I may have um, a little more knowledge about wildlife and some of the nuisance impacts that they can have on your garden, whether it's vegetables, whether it's flowers. Um, and I figure the best way to demonstrate this would just to be to walk you around my wife and I's gardens. Um, we live in North Guilford, Connecticut. We have lots of deer around us um, and we have minimal deer damage uh, from some of the strategies that I can highlight um, to you today as far as um, preferential browsing, um, location of plantings, and so forth. Um, and it, I'm an expert with deer, but also obviously we have rabbits that can cause damage to gardens. Um, and a really frustrating one is um, voles. I guess I will address that a little bit. Voles are very tricky and very, very frustrating for a gardener. Um, so with that, I will um, start you on our tour here. So garden placement is a uh, where in your yard you plant your garden can uh, work to deter wildlife too. This is my wife's perennial bed. Not too much flowering these days, um, but we got Katona, Katona Aster, um, Montauk daisies and such. Um, and we got some, looks like some honeybees working right here. Cool. But anyhow, um, you can see her perennial bed, there's the house right there, so it's right close to the house. So um, we've had minimal damage in here despite there being some preferred brown species in this garden. So I just pulled in at a colleague's house, I'm taking care of her cat for her, and I see her front yard has a little gardening lesson I can uh, share with you all. Let's go have a look. So as I mentioned um, before, deer have different browsing preferences. There's different plants they prefer over others. One of which they prefer are hosta. So you can see in her foundation planting, she's got hosta right here. Look at them, big ones here. Um, and because they're adjacent to the house and the foundation planting, um, the deer are less likely to come and, and consume them so close to the house. But if you have an overwhelming number of deer in your neighborhood, um, that won't prevent them. But plant placement is a good um, strategy as well. So you can see your garden's doing quite well. And um, um, they're in, in Durham, Connecticut, where there are plenty of deer around. So um, foundation and plant location is a good a good strategy too. Right, we're gonna go find a cat. More garden placement. This is right off the front porch steps. Uh, right here. And then we have daylilies up front. And everyone knows that daylilies are deer's favorite. Um, but these are doing well. These have done quite well every year. This is, you can see our front fence here, our small front yard, and we have the road right here. So this isn't to say we're enticing deer into the road to come across the much on the daylilies, but the deer tend to learn to avoid the road. And therefore you can get away with planting some of the more um, preferred species closer to the road that they're avoiding because obviously they hopefully have learned that playing in traffic is not a good thing but. so my wife's putting in a new garden um, for pollinators and honeybees and so forth uh, and she refuses to be on camera, but I just asked her what were some of her strategies. And she said she utilized a guide written by Dr. Ward, um, chief of forestry and horticulture, um, who wrote a plant uh, gardening with deer um, station bulletin that I can provide a link to. 
and she said she was interspersing um, stuff, preferred browse species with stuff that's unpreferred. It has a strong scent to it. Um, the strong scented stuff they tend to not enjoy as much and not receive as much damage to. So part of the bags, you can see her compost bag still um, garden in the works here, but we got some pollinator species going in and she was saying she's mixing in dill and other strong scented stuff with the more preferred browse species um, and they so they have to be selective but I think um, we're going to get some browse damage in here and to help give, get things established she's been using um, a deer repellent um, that can be purchased at your local um, agricultural supply store um, Again, this garden is just getting established, but you can see we're pollinator friendly yard and just across the yard here we have my uh, my beehives. Not only am I an amateur gardener, but I'm also an amateur beekeeper, though they're doing quite well so far this year and quite active today. Ooh, just So a little, little on deer repellents. Um, deer repellents can be pricey. They can be used to um, prevent deer from eating your garden, or helping get established. Um, there's many different formulations of them, and you can ask at your local supply agricultural supply store which ones work best. Um, can't really recommend brands, but if they've been on the market for over 10 years, you can best bet that they are quite effective and work well. Um, but, uh, so some of them, let's see, deer are easily conditioned and you can use that to your advantage to negatively condition them to your garden. So hanging a bar of Irish spring soap, you know, that's local lore and it may work cause it's unfamiliar initially, but there's no negative stimulus associated with that. So for instance, if you were to have an electric fence around your garden, the negative stimulus would be a shock and they'd learn quickly not to come to your garden. Similarly with the repellents, most all of them have a, a, a scent to them and hot pepper component so when the deer consume it they go through some sort of pain in, the, in their mouth due to that hot pepper. So they learn to associate your garden and that pain together and hopefully learn to avoid um, your garden as a result. So um, like because deer are easy, easily habituated to um, it's best to use different formulations of repellents and sort of mix them up and keep deer on their toes as they can get accustomed to um, one if it's overused. Um, and I briefly mentioned fencing. Let's go over, uh, let's take a look at my vegetable garden over here. So my wife does the flowers and perennials and I do the vegetables. Um, I got, let's see, I got my fence here. I think so any gardener in Connecticut, vegetable gardener really needs a fence. Um, this one goes right down to the ground. I've had no problems with rabbits or deer for that matter. Is a five foot fence like this one? Is this deer proof? Absolutely not. But because my garden is relatively small, it's um, a small plot. It's got raised beds in it. It's small. Um, like I said, small. It's not worth it for a deer to attempt to jump over this fence to get in here. Um, because they're gonna have difficulty getting out. So deer haven't, won't put themselves in jeopardy and I have yet to, in my 10 years with this garden setup, have yet to have any damage with inside the, this fence. If you put a 10 foot fence around an 80 acre farm, I'm, I'm sorry, a five foot fence around an 80 acre farm, yep, you're gonna have problems because deer will easily jump into that. Um, so if you're looking to do large areas, you really need fencing on the order of eight to ten feet and even that high a deer can get over it um, but are less likely to do so uh, so you can see i got my potatoes are doing great just starting to fade actually might need to harvest them soon um, my lettuce is bolted over there pardon me my onions are going to flower some of them um, lettuce here i planted pretty tight so it's not bolting beets are doing great peas um, peppers tomatoes asparagus everything's doing pretty well this year 
Um, here's another crop that can get some damage here. Blueberries, and blueberries typically um, more bird and um, bear damage if you're in bear country as well. Um, but ours, these are a late blue variety, so they don't ripen until August or so. So what we typically do is harvest a few bowls, big bowlfuls, a bunch of quarts, and then we kind of let them over to the robins and catbirds who enjoy them. But if you're looking for increased harvest, obviously with your fruit crops like this, you really have to net them. And the nets need to go um, right down to the ground and you need to pin them to the ground or else the birds will find their way underneath and so forth. Here's the back side of that oak leaf hydrangea, the pollinators like so much. Wow, look at them go. Um, I'm here I'll use this as a backdrop to talk about rabbit damage versus deer damage. Um, deer don't have upper incisors, upper teeth, upper front teeth I should say. So when they bite a stem they have to tear it and pull it off. So you'll see uh, with deer damage you'll see a branch with a trailing frayed edge um, and you know that's deer. I have some images I can probably put up on this video. And then uh, rabbit damage, rabbit have great teeth, so they shear at a 45 degree angle. So um, they're similar damage patterns, but deer leave that frayed edge, whereas rabbits shear it off cleanly. And sometimes you can find, you know, rabbit damage up two or three feet off the ground, and it's not because they're super rabbits it's because they were on top of the snow over the winter so don't be fooled by that um, but that's just it helps helping define what's causing the damage can help you figure out how to prioritize and strategize and figure out how to stop that damage from occurring I like these guys covered in pollen Smells great. Cool. Look at them. So we talked a bit about deer, probably too much about deer. Uh, let's talk about voles. So this Katoni Aster. One year, oh, the voles got in here and girdled this thing right to the ground, right at ground level over the winter. And I thought for certain this thing was a goner, but my wife said, let's let, let it go, see what it does. And she was right, it came back, but the voles will tunnel underneath the snow and they are um, vegetarians versus moles, which are insectivores. So the, the voles come Neat that cambium layer around um, the tree stems like a little mini porcupine and they can be very frustrating um, so I find the best way to control them is either with a snap trap um, like a regular mouse trap right about here I found a hole where they came out of the ground out of the grass and into my wife's garden right here at this mulch edge and I put a snap trap down and I was able to kill three or four. Just as they come out of the hole, they um, make contact with the striker and set it off. Um, you wanna be careful with this because you don't wanna get any birds or any non-target species. Um, so you're really gonna make sure that hole is um, being utilized by the voles. Um, or else you could, it's painstaking, but if you have plants that are repeatedly hitting, you could put a hardware cloth barrier around it or around the stem. I know it's a lot of work, but it'll um, it'll prevent them from accessing it. Just physical physical exclusion, just like any kinds of fencing, it tends to work about 100% of the time once you go through the effort. It's getting hot out now. Um, so to break things down, let's see, what did we talk about? We talked about potential use of repellents um, for both deer and rabbit damage. Uh, we talked about preferential browsing and placement of plants within your garden or around your property. 
Uh, most garden centers around Connecticut now have tags on species that are deer resistant and if you do your homework you can find pretty flowering perennials that are in fact deer resistant and deer won't touch. Um, I've worked with deer for a long time and they never stop surprising me so there's some species that they typically don't touch but if times are tough and they're stressed and, and looking for food they will consume them but sort of as a last ditch so there's a sliding scale on palatability for deer and like I said the garden centers or the folks there the staff are, are very knowledgeable and can help you there so that's a great way to go Dr. Ward's bulletin good place to go to as well for that um, let's see what else we talked we talked about fencing electric fencing is ideal because you give them that negative stimulus um, five foot fencing you can do on smaller garden plots, 10 foot fencing on larger acreages, which can get expensive. Um, and then for rabbits, similar, you just have to physically exclude them and get your fence down to the ground level. Um, and lethal removal of these animals is a possibility too. Um, you got to watch Connecticut game laws because um, both rabbits and deer are a regulated game species. Um, but you can uh, potentially trap and relocate an problem animals, <clears throat> but make sure you're following state guidelines when it comes to that. Um, aside from that, um, I hope you picked up a few things on this. Um, it's uh, definitely an odd plant science day format with me just talking instead of some back and forth and conversing with folks, which I much prefer. But anyhow, I hope you got something from this video and if nothing else we're a little bit entertained by um, my garden and some of uh, our antics. All right, thank you. Uh, have a good day. Hi, welcome to Plant Science Day 2020. I'm Mike Short. I'm a research technician here at the Agricultural Experiment Station. And today I'm going to discuss with you methods and techniques for keeping small animals out of your gardens and your flower beds. Before we discuss ways to keep animals out of your garden, we'll first talk about some ways to identify what animals might be getting in your garden. You can identify some animals by their tracks, by their tail drag, or perhaps even from their scat or their poo. The first few things I'm going to talk about today are cultural practices. Those are things that you can do to your property to make them less hospitable to small mammals. Raised garden beds, we all know, have many benefits to growing plants, but they're also useful to keep some animals that aren't very well good climbers from staying out of your garden beds. Another idea is to get rid of brush piles that are, have accumulated on your property. Rabbits and other small mammals like to nest and den in brush piles. And securing access to under sheds and decks is a very good idea. Woodchucks especially like to burrow under decks and sheds, as well as some other crit critters such as skunks, which we don't want living under our decks. Uh, keep your lawn trimmed and keep it weed free. Rabbits really love clover and they'll be munching on any tall grass that's on your property. And next I'm going to talk about aversion techniques. There's fear aversion, smell aversion, and taste aversion. Fear aversion can be simple as a scarecrow or a plastic owl placed on a pole outside your garden or even plastic snakes placed inside your garden beds. And smell and taste aversions are primarily repellents. They could be spray on repellents or sprinkle on repellents. And they're usually a putrid smell or have off tastes such as pepper or peppermint. Some of the drawbacks with repellents is that they need to be replied, reapplied quite often after any heavy rains or as the plants grow taller. Now let's talk about eliminating small animals from your property. This is done primarily through trapping. 
We have two methods, live trapping and kill traps. Kill traps are primarily snap traps used for mice that are in your garden shed or in your basement or even in your house. Live trapping is a method to get rid of larger animals off of your property. I don't recommend live trapping because there are several issues that must be considered. The primary issue is disposal of the animal. It's against Connecticut state law to trans transport nuisance wildlife off of your property without a permit. This must be performed by a licensed nuisance wildlife operator. And finally, the most effective method of keeping animals out of your property is, of course, a fence. Fencing is very effective. You can fence individual plants, such as a row of lettuce in your garden. You can fence your entire garden with a short fence or a long fence to keep out all small animals and larger animals. And you can fence your entire property with an eight-foot deer fence. Electric fences are quite effective as well, although they are a bit of a danger to small children and your pets. There are a few drawbacks to fencing. It can be a little bit unsightly in your landscape. They could be costly to install and they do require some maintenance. Other than that, fencing is a great option for keeping small animal pests out of your gardens. Now all of these techniques work great individually, but I would recommend an integrated approach using different techniques at different times of the year. Sometimes the animals will become accustomed to certain techniques that you're using, so it's good to switch them up throughout the growing season. Well, this concludes my short technical demonstration for today. Thanks for listening, and if you have any questions, please feel free to contact me at my email, michael.short at ct.gov. And I hope to see you all next year at Plant Science Day 2021 at Lockwood Farm in Hanford.